So in this video, we are going to look at an example of a problem that we will solve using a looping strategy, in particular a while loop, and then we will ask the question, could we actually write that in a for loop as well? Because in one of the previous videos, I told you that there are problems, so most problems can be solved with both a for and a while loop, but there are problems that can only be solved with a while loop that is more generic than the more specific for loop that can only work under certain circumstances. So let's look at the example create a new notebook file and let's call it Collards, named after a mathematician who had uh, who suggested a game and uh, then he asked a, a um, theoretical question about it. So um, let's go ahead and um, call the file Collards Conjecture. So Conjecture in math world is always something that people think is correct but they cannot prove it yet. Okay, so with high confidence, we know this is true, but we cannot prove it at using a mathematical proof um, concept. So let's do the following. Let's look at a game, and the game goes like this. Given a positive integer, do the following. If the integer, if n, or let's call it n, if given a positive integer, let's call it n, if n is even, then the next n is just half the previous n. Okay, so if n is 10, then the next uh, n would just be 5. Otherwise, so if n is odd, then the next n is 3 times the old n plus 1. Okay, and the game ends. So game ends if n reaches 1. And now the question is, the big question is, does n always reach 1? Okay, so that is the game we are going to implement in code. So let's go ahead and do that. And of course, we are going ahead and we will do so in a while loop first. That is the whole point of this video because as we will see that this will be very hard to do in um, with a for loop. So going ahead with um, a while loop, let's do the following. Suppose n is, for example, 10. Let's write a while loop that checks a condition of when the game is done, okay? And the condition is uh, once we reach the number one. So in other words, while n is not equal to one, this is the condition that is true as long as the game is still going on, okay? So um, that is why we use a while loop here to determine if the game is still on or if we are already at the end. So let's go in the, in the while loop. We now have to decide if the current n is either an even or an odd number. We know how to do that. So let's go ahead and say if n modulo divided by two has no rest, so if n percentage sign 2, so modulo operator has no rest, so division by 2 has no rest, then the new n is going to be the old n divided by 2. Okay, so now remember how when we uh, looked into division, using a single slash operator is the normal division operator, and this will always give us back a floating point number. However, n is supposed to be an integer at all times. So we start with an integer and uh, we always get an integer just like this as well. So in other words, what we are going to do is we are going to use the double slash here, okay? So n divided by two using the double slash will preserve the integer data type, okay? And now if we see this here, if we see the new n is set to the old n divided by two, what we could also do is we could simply use the shortcut version like this, double slash equals two, okay? So this is basically the shortcut version. And again, the double slash is only there to preserve the data type. Then we go ahead and say, let's model the else clause. So in other words, if the number n is odd, then what we are going to do is the new n is going to be the old n times three. So let's write three times n plus one, okay? And the second expression here, 
cannot be simplified just like the first one here because the first one was a simple update uh, div simply divide n by two and that's the new n but here we have a second uh, operand the plus so we cannot make this any shorter okay so um, this is basically it and now let's also go ahead and um, in the first line in the in the while loop let's also go ahead and simply write print n and let's print the current n on one line let's go ahead and the program uh, outputs 10, 5, 16, 8, 4, and 2, and then 2 divided by 2 would be 1. So we would also have to go ahead and say print 1 here as well, and then we see the 1, okay? The 1 is not shown because once n becomes 1, um, the, the while loop is basically over, so the condition becomes false, and we are not going into the while loop again. So this print uh, function call here will not happen once n has become 1. This is why we need to say print either n or print one down here. So print n also works, of course. Okay, and now we can play with it. So let's start, let's say for example, with 20 instead of 10. And let's see, 20 is even, so we divide it by two, it becomes 10. 10 is even, so we divide it by two, it becomes five. Five is odd, so we multiply it by three and add one to it, this becomes 16 and then so on. So now the question is, do we always uh, get to the number one? And it turns out that no one ever has proven it so far. And that is why we call um, this um, thing the Collett's conjecture and not the Collett's proof. So if we could prove it, then probably um, this example would be called the, the Collett's proof in math terms, but it's not provable. So um, we call it the Collett's conjecture. And now let's also get an intuition why this is the case. So let's uh, start with 10 again. And let's see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers. If I go to, let's say, 100, I get more numbers, okay? So this already looks like um, if I start with a bigger n, then the series, until I reach the number one, must become longer. So let's uh, go ahead and use 1,000. And 1,000 will still get um, uh, longer, so it, it seems that our intuit intuitive rules uh, th uh, seems to hold. Let's go to 10,000, and all of a sudden, the series becomes smaller again. Okay, so depending on what the start value is, we either converge very fast or not so fast towards one. But at the end of the day, um, we always reach one. At least whenever I tried this function or this code here, I always reached one, no matter what the start value wa uh, was. So it seems like this statement is always true here. Do, do we always reach one? The answer should be yes, but again, no one has proven it so far. And uh, by the fact that this number, the series of numbers until we reach one, sometimes becomes longer as n increases and sometimes becomes smaller or shorter as n increases. This is already the indication or the intuition uh, why this is mathematically a very hard problem to solve um, because there is no one-to-one co one -one correspondence between larger n's and the length of the sequence we get. Okay, and if we want to write a function to do that, what we could do is we could um, highlight all the code, we indent everything uh, to the left-hand side by one level, the first n where it's set to uh, 10,000 here, we don't need actually, because we are going to write define the collets function and the collets function will take n as the parameter. And now we have to go ahead and write some nice uh, doc string. So let's do that. And um, let's go ahead and simply copy paste this here in here. And let's write here, um, print a collet sequence, oops, print a collet sequence in descending order maybe. Let's have an empty line here. So now here we have um, a nice description of the game, given a positive integer n and so on. And then of course we should not forget to also write arcs here. n, it's an integer, and it's, uh, it must be a positive number. So let's write a positive number to start the collets sequence. And uh, let me see if we have to change something here. No, we don't. So um, the, the idea of this uh, function is, as it says in the subject line, print a collet sequence. Okay, so this function has a side effect. So it does not have a return value. That's, that is why we don't have a return here. The function does not calculate something. It simply prints out the sequence because that is the task here. 
And if I execute this, I now have a function and now I can uh, go ahead and call the function a couple of times, for example, with the number 10. And um, let's do this, make it 100, let make it 1000, we see it becomes longer. And then as, uh, as we just saw, if we make this 10,000, then the series all of a sudden becomes smaller again. Okay, so this is now in uh, one picture, how we could write that, how we could write a nice function doing that. It's nicely documented and that is it. So why can we not use the for loop here to solve this problem? That is a theoretical question. And remember that in previous videos, when I introduced um, a couple of problems using that were solved using a for loop, then I always said that we could always, before the code actually ran, tell how often we had to loop. Okay, the number of iterations in the loop, the number of uh, times that uh, a certain piece of code was repeated was deterministic. We could calculate it, okay? For factorial of three, for example, we know we have to do three iterations. For the Fibonacci number, it was not the same as the index of the Fibonacci number we wanted to calculate, but it was some constant smaller than this. Okay, so we could predict the number of iterations. Here, however, as we see, we cannot predict how long, how many numbers it takes, or how many iterations it takes. Therefore, that is the indication, that is the intuitive reason why we cannot use the for loop here, okay? So in other words, um, the while loop can always be used whenever a for loop also works, but the for loop is usually a simplification. But then there are examples just like this example here, the Collets conjecture, um, where we have to specify some end condition and we are not sure when this is reached or if at all, okay? So um, that is uh, why this um, example is of also theoretical uh, nature a bit to get the point across that not all problems can be solved using a for loop. And in particular, in the next uh, video, we are also going to look at uh, how we can model interactive games. So games where a program takes inputs from a user, a guessing game, for example, like guessing a toy cost or something like that. And then um, the user, it depends on the user when the game is done. So also for interactive games or for or whenever you write a program where a computer has to wait for manual input by some user, then also oftentimes you can implement that using a while loop and not in a for loop usually. Okay, so uh, these are applications of the while loop. This is it for this video. And in the next video, we are going to see how, we, how else we can use uh, the while loop. See you then.